Hola amigos! Hope everybody is doing well and welcome back for another exciting week of Spanish. Uh, this week we're moving on to Capítulo 8, Chapter 8, titled Fiestas y Vacaciones. So, um, I don't know about you, but everyone likes vacationing and having parties, right? So, wouldn't you like to be on this beach right now laying in one of these chairs? I think that sounds pretty nice right now. Okay, so uh, our goal in this chapter is for you to be able to communicate about holidays, special events, and vacations, to inquire and provide information about people and events, to communicate about past events and activities, to create questions in Spanish using interrogative words, uh, most importantly, to differentiate between the preterite and the imperfect, the two past tenses in Spanish, uh, and then also to utilize affirmative and negative expressions in written and spoken speech. So we're going to start just by taking a look here at um, the vocabulary in this chapter. Uh, as always, we're not going to hit every word. You still need to study your flashcards and all that good stuff, but I uh, just want to make sure you're familiar. So uh, first, let's start with the most important part of the party. Down here you have el pastel, the cake, and on the cake there are velas, candles, you can see that they're eating some entremeses here, some hors d'oeuvres, uh, and someone has brought some regalos, some presents. Of course, uh, there's always a child who has to llorar, has to cry, llorar. Um, and then you see the anfitrión and anfitriona, the host anfitrión and hostess anfitriona, who are going to hacer un brindis. They're going to make a toast, hacer un brindis. And then over here you see the invitados, the people who are invited, the guest. Oh, and over here you can see uh, this thing. Uh, this woman, it looks like, is holding a mascara. And this poor little boy has to get under the table um, as a result of being asustarse. Uh, asustarse is to scare or to be frightened by asustarse. And then this woman here, uh, she likes to gritar, to scream. So some vocab for the chapter. Uh, speaking of, in... Uh, in MindTap this week, you may be asked to do something like this, where I give you a term, and you have to match it up. So number one says we're referring to a persona que da una fiesta, a person who gives a party. Well, a person who gives a party is likely the host or the hostess. So we're going to match number one with letter B, anfitrión or anfitriona. Okay, I'd like for you to pause your audio, give numbers two through five a try in the same way. All right, now that you've had a second to try these, uh, number two tells us this is algo que cubre la cara, something that covers your face. Uh, well, that would be a mask, and a mask in Spanish is letter E, la máscara, máscara. Number three, cuando muchas personas no trabajan, when a lot of people don't work. Uh, COVID-19 is not an answer. Uh, when a lot of people are not working, the correct answer here should be a holiday. Um, a lot of people are off on holidays. Not everyone, but a lot of people. So it should be el día feriado. A holiday, el día feriado, letter A. Number four, a día que se celebra con regalos y un pastel con velas. So a day that is celebrated with presents and a cake with candles. Uh, that's generally a birthday, el cumpleaños, letter D. Okay, uh, number five, these are comidas que se comen o que se ofrecen en las fiestas. So foods that are eaten or that are offered in parties, a lot of times those are hors d'oeuvres, los entremeses. Okay, hopefully you are feeling okay on your vocab. One of the first grammatical things that we discuss in this chapter are palabras, excuse me, palabras interrogativas. So these are your interrogative words in Spanish or um, so question words, basically, where, how, when, how many, how much, those kind of words. So we're going to go through these, and then I have a little tool to help you remember them. So as we get started, um, you'll notice the word donde here means where. And in Spanish, we have a donde, to where, plain old donde, where, and de donde, from where. And depending on the context, you can see these all used interchangeably. So, for example, a donde is most often used to ask to where someone is going. So, where are you going? A donde vas? Uh, now, you, you may have heard in English it's incorrect to end a sentence in a preposition, where are you going to? And that is correct. You, you should not end a sentence in a preposition. 
Um, in Spanish, we don't do that. We say, to where are you going? A donde vas? Which is actually the correct way of saying that. Um, donde by itself is usually used to refer to the location of a thing, person, or place, such as where's the bathroom or where's the library? Donde está el baño? Donde está la biblioteca? De donde is used to ask from where, usually when you're talking about someone's origin, so where are you from? Again, we don't end our sentences in a preposition. Instead of saying where are you from in English, we should say from where are you, which is what we say in Spanish. De donde eres or de donde es usted? Where are you from? From where are you? Okay, so that's your little summary of donde. Uh, the word como in Spanish means how, just like como estas. So if you want to ask how someone's doing, como estas, or como está el profesor. Um, you can also use como with the verb ser instead of the verb estar. And uh, in doing that, instead of asking how he's doing, like his condition, instead of como está el profesor, how is he doing, like is he sick, está enfermo, we could ask how the professor, like, what's he like? What are his characteristics? Como es el profesor? Es simpático? Is he nice? Es antipático? Is he mean? Right? Um, uh, you can also use como to ask somehow um, how something is done. Like, como terminaste la tarea? How did you finish your homework? Or, uh, como terminaste la construcción en tu casa tan temprano? How did you finish... The construction at your house so quickly, right? How? Inquisitively. Um, also, we have cuanto and cuantos. When used by itself, cuanto means how much. Like, cuanto cuestan los intermeses, how much do the hors d'oeuvres cost? Cuanto cuestan. Um, but cuantos or cuantas usually communicates how many. So, cuantas personas vienen a la fiesta. How many people are coming to the party. Notice cuantas agrees with personas, both of which are feminine plural. So um, cuantas personas vienen. Okay, some other um, interrogative words that are very popular. You see quien used a lot. Quien means who. Uh, you can also make this plural by adding an es on the end, quien es, uh, which would just mean like who all. So quien es él? Quienes son ellos? Who is he and who are they? Quienes él y quienes son ellos? Um, you also can use de quien if you want to ask of whom or whose, blah, blah, blah. So de quien es el libro, literally of whom is the book or whose book is this? De quien es el libro, that's also a popular phrase. My personal favorite is por qué. Por qué means why unless you space it together without an accent, and then it means because, but uh, por qué in this context means why. And usually you're asking for a reason when you ask por qué. Um, so, por qué quieres salir? Why do you want to leave? Por qué? Why? Uh, you also can use para qué instead of por qué, which means like for what purpose. So, uh, para qué tiene los cohetes? Why does he have the rockets? Para qué? What is the purpose of the rockets, basically? Um, you also have qual or cuales. Um, typically, we see qual used a lot more frequently in Spanish than in English. And um, in English, it would be translated more as which, but it can also be translated as what. So, for example, if you're asking what is the date, you can't say que es la fecha, because que literally does mean what, but it doesn't work like that. You say cual es la fecha, which is the date, or ¿Cuál es tu número de teléfono? What's your phone number? ¿Cuál es tu dirección? What's your address, right? Like, uh, it's odd that we do that. It's a very weird thing about Spanish that you use cuál instead of qué here. Um, fun fact, cuál cannot be followed immediately by a noun. Instead, um, qué will be used. So what class do you have right now? ¿Qué clase tienes ahora? Uh, and then K is often probably the most popular one here. Um, K usually means what, it can mean which, but 90% of the time it means what. Um, que quiere tu mamá? What does your mom want? Usually you're asking for a very simple explanation or sometimes a definition. Que quiere? So I could just make you memorize all of these and I would be the, the big mean Spanish teacher if I did that. So instead, uh, we are going to listen to a little song that's going to help you. Uh, no matter where you are and what month you're listening, um, you can have Christmas in June or July or October, whenever you listen to this video. It is to the tune of Jingle Bells, and it most certainly will help you remember. So let's take a moment and listen, amigos, very quickly. Hey, 
kind of get the hang of this. Um, I love this song and it's very helpful in the classroom for teaching these interrogative words. Again, I say this in a lot of our videos, but be thankful you're not in the in-person course. I would be making you like sing these. So they're opposed to being online, right? All right. So um, I'm going to give you a few questions. You'll see something like this on my Spanish lab. As always, I just want you to practice. It's going to give you um, first a question and then an answer. So the first slash mark here is the question. The second slash mark is the answer. And you're given two options to choose between. You need to pick the correct question word. So let's do a couple of these together and then I'll turn you loose. Uh, number one, either de donde, from where, or donde está, where is, el mejor hotel de la ciudad de Guatemala. So from where or where is the best hotel in Guatemala City? Well, automatically, you wouldn't say from where is the best hotel. We're just going to say where is, donde está. And that just makes sense. We don't have to keep reading, but we can. It's in El Centro Histórico y es el Hotel Panamérica. Number two, ¿cómo o cuándo son los cuartos en ese hotel? So either ¿cómo, how, or ¿cuándo, when are the rooms in that hotel? And this person says, oh, son grandes, they're big, y también hay unas suites. So uh, we would probably ask, how or when are the rooms? Yeah, it should be how, ¿cómo? Remember, if you're having trouble remembering these, just sing your song. Por qué, why, cuando, when, qué, what, donde, where, cuánto, how much, como, how, quién means who is there. Hey, okay, so I'll stop singing for you. I'd like for you, pretty please, to give numbers three, four, and five a try on your own. Go ahead and pause your audio. All right, now that you've got a second to try these, number three. Ask you or cuánto or cuántas cuesta el alojamiento en el hotel. So how much does the lodging cost in the hotel? Uh, well, obviously, we know the answer in this case cannot be cuántas. How do we know that? Because it does not agree in gender and number with cuesta. Um, remember, cuántas always agrees in gender and number with whatever noun follows it. In this case, we're asking cuánto cuesta. How much does it cost? Cuánto cuesta. Number four. ¿Qué o quién es van con nosotros a la discoteca esta noche? So what or who all is going with us to the, to the bar, to the discotheque tonight? Well, you wouldn't say what is going with us. Probably who all. So quién es. And number five. ¿Dónde o quién es tu amiga que sabe tanto sobre marimba? So where or who is your friend that knows so much about marimba? You got to keep reading to know. It says, mi amiga Luisa es experta en marimba. So my friend Luisa is an expert in marimba. So we wouldn't say 
where is she? We're asking who is she? So quién es? Should be quién. Okay. All right, guys. So this is the moment you have been waiting for. Our probably the most difficult grammar structure you will learn, in my opinion, in all of Spanish, is the preterite versus the imperfect. So. We're going to spend some time on this. We're going to talk about it. We're going to make sure you feel nice and good and comfortable with these things. So as we get started with the preterite and the imperfect, remember, both of these are the two past tenses in Spanish. We don't just wake up one day and decide, hey, I'm going to use the preterite today and tomorrow I'm going to use the imperfect. That's not how it works. There are specific rules that tell you um, when to use the preterite and when to use the imperfect. Um, some of these you already know. Generally, the preterite is used for a specific time frame in which something occurred. Uh, yo te llamé a las ocho. I called you at eight. Eight o'clock is a very specific time. It's when I called you. Also, the preterite is generally used for single completed actions. Marta dio una fiesta de sorpresa para su marido. Marta threw a surprise party for her husband. Done. She threw the party. It's over. Done. A single completed action. So specific times and completed actions use the preterite. The imperfect is the complete opposite of that. It is used for habitual or uh, ongoing actions in the past. Um, so, for example, Tomás y Marta siempre celebraban los cumpleaños. So Thomas and Marta always used to celebrate their birthdays. Um, a lot of times the preterite can be translated, this sometimes helps students, a lot of times the preterite is translated as ed, whereas the imperfect is translated as used to or would always. Sometimes it helps to think about that. Like if you look at the examples, Marta dio, she gave or she threw a party, done. I called you at eight o'clock, done, right? But the imperfect, they would always celebrate. They always used to celebrate. So you can see the difference there in the preterite and the imperfect. Some more examples. The preterite, um, especially when you're reading a story, the preterite usually talks about a series of events or a series of completed actions. And it also highlights the main action, usually, of the story. So, for example, um, highlighting a main action, Tomas llegó a casa. Tomas arrived home. That's a main action. We're highlighting that he arrived. For a series of events, Tomas llegó a las nueve, entró en la casa, Puso la tele y me llamó por teléfono. So Thomas arrived at 9, entered in the house, turned on the TV, called me on the phone, right? Boom, boom, boom. Series of events. All past. The imperfect, in the sense of storytelling, usually sets the stage for the preterite action. It's like the background event that kind of, uh, it can be talking about the time, the location, the mood, weather, physical and emotional states. It's the, the background info. So if you were... Once upon a time, that's going to be the imperfect, right? Whereas um, whatever your very specific event is, is probably going to be the preterite. So an example for you. Esa noche hacía fresco y Tomás estaba muy cansado. That night, it was really, really calm. And Thomas was very tired, okay? So again, just setting the scene for you, if you will. Um, some more examples of preterite imperfect. The preterite usually specifies a beginning or ending of an event. Um, a las once de la noche empezó a llover. At 11 o'clock at night, it began to rain. When did it begin? At 11 o'clock. How many times can you begin something? Only once, usually. So empezar and terminar, to begin and to end, are verbs that are commonly used with the preterite, what we will call preterite triggers. I'll talk to you more about that in just a moment. But empezar and terminar. Usually always go with the preterite. Some imperfect examples. Um, whereas the preterite emphasizes the beginning or ending of something, the imperfect is more of the middle of the event or an emphasis on some kind of indefinite continuation or indefinite period of time during the event. So, for example, in la fiesta, algunos de los invitados hablaban mientras otros comían. So at the party... Some of the guests were talking while others were eating. Um, we don't know how long they were talking. We don't know how long they were eating. It's an ongoing sort of middle event, okay? Um, notice that, ver that, um, that word there, mientras, which means while, 
In this case, it's used to describe two simultaneous actions in the past. Very commonly used here. So make sure you know mientras, while. Okay, uh, some more examples for you for preterite and imperfect. Uh, the, this is my favorite part, okay? Um, the preterite is the action that interrupts another action or event, whereas the imperfect is usually an ongoing action in the past that is interrupted. So uh, I like to think about horror movies. I don't know if you guys like to watch horror movies or not, um, but there's always a dumb blonde, right, in the horror movie, and she's always doing something stupid, like there's a noise in the basement. Let me go see what it is, you know? Um, so... Uh, I like to use a horror movie example to explain this. So, um, when the dumb blonde was walking down the stairs, the killer snatched her, okay? When she was walking down the stairs, that's an ongoing event. She was walking. It's the imperfect. Was walking. It's translated as was or worrying. So, when she was walking down the stairs, the killer snatched her. How many times did he snatch her? Only once. Okay, so take that and apply it back to this scenario here. The ongoing event or action that gets interrupted, she was walking down the stairs. That certainly got interrupted by him snatching her. Um, and the action that did the interrupting, the preterite, the snatching, um, is preterite because it only happened once. So another example, cuando Tomás entró en la casa, when Thomas entered in the house, los invitados cantaban, the guests were singing. So uh, Thomas's walking in the house is what does the interrupting of the guest singing. Okay, so think about that, the interrupted and the interrupting actions. All right, I told you that there were some trigger words for the preterite and the imperfect, and you can see those here. Very common preterite trigger words. Ayer, yesterday. Anteayer, the day before yesterday. Anoche, last night. Una vez, this one time. Dos veces, twice or two times. Anything with pasado, la semana pasada, last week, el mes pasado, last month, el lunes pasado, last Monday. Um, and my favorite one, de repente, all of a sudden. Those are your preterite triggers. Your common imperfect triggers are todos los días, every day, cada semana, really anything with cada. Cada means every. So every week, cada semana, every month, cada mes, every Monday, cada lunes. Always, siempre, frecuentemente, frequently, anything with childhood is always imperfect, de niño, or as a young person, de joven, right? So these are things that you need to just memorize, that when you see these, you're automatically going to use this specific tense, okay? Um, there are situations where the verb changes meaning, depending on which whether you use the preterite or the imperfect. So a good example of this is the verb saber which means to know. If you conjugate saber in the preterite as supe, you're saying I found out. But if you conjugate it as sabia, you're saying I knew. Okay, uh, same thing with the verb querer. Querer is to want. If you conjugate querer in the preterite, quise, you're saying I wanted to and I did. If you conjugate it in the imperfect, quería, I wanted to, but we don't know if that outcome actually happened or not. Okay. So here's a summary of all of these things. The preterite on your left we use for completed actions, specific beginning and endings, um, one-time actions, the interrupting action, things that are translated as ending in ed, a series of events, and transitions. For the imperfect, uh, we use the imperfect to refer to habitual or repeated actions, to things with an indefinite time period, to ongoing or interrupted actions, uh, things that are translated as was or worrying, descriptions, emotions and health, childhood or things that are translated as used to, and time and age. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like a lot to memorize, right? You're probably thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to remember all this? Well, the good news, uh, I have an acronym for you to help you. You may remember when we, when we were studying about ser and estar, I gave you the acronym topic for ser and place for estar. I'm going to give you an acronym for the preterite. This acronym is BOIST, B-O-I-S-T, okay, just like moist, that all people hate that word, right? But BOIST, B-O-I-S-T. The B in BOIST stands for the beginning or ending of an action. 
and it includes common verbs such as comenzar, empezar, and terminar. The O in voiced stands for one-time events. These include those trigger words like ayer, yesterday, anoche, last night, anteayer, the day before yesterday, and anything with pasado, la semana pasada, el mes pasado, el año pasado. So voiced, beginning or ending of an action, one-time events. The I is the interruption. When something is going on and another action interrupts it, the action that does the interrupting is the preterite. Think about the dumb blonde. When the dumb blonde was walking down the stairs, the killer snatched her. Okay, he the snatching interrupts the walking. So the snatching is preterite, but the walking is imperfect. Um, okay, so beginning or ending of events, one-time events, the interrupting action, the S stands for a series of events. So uh, when something happened, boom, 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 right after the next. So I woke up, took a shower, went to the store, stopped at Starbucks and got a coffee, boom, 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 preterite. Um, and finally, the T in voice stands for transitions. These are uh, common words that you see like primero, first, segundo, second, tercero, third, Luego and entonces, which both mean then, or por fin, por último, which both mean finally. Uh, all of those are kind of trigger words for the preterite as well. So, voiced, beginning or ending of actions, one-time events, interrupting actions, series of events, and transitions. Um, so, I want you, I'm going to make this full screen so you can't see my answers. Okay, I want you to look at these sentences, and I want you to give me a reason from Boist as to why they are in the preterite. So number one, ayer yo hice la tarea. Yesterday I did my homework. There's multiple things you can say here. You can say, ooh, ooh, ayer is a trigger word. Boom, preterite. That works. Or you can say it's a one-time event. It's a specific time, yesterday. Number two, tú fuiste al mercado, compraste comida, Regresaste a casa y cocinaste la cena. Why might I use the preterite here? You went to the market. You bought food. You returned home. And you cooked dinner. Well, this is a series of events, things that you did. So that's a preterite area from voiced. Number three, nosotros terminamos de jugar. We stopped playing. Well, why is this preterite? Well, you can only stop doing something once. So sort of a one-time action. Or you might also say it's the beginning or ending of an action. Remember the verbs terminar, to end, and empezar, to begin. Always use the preterite. Number four. Primero, él fue a la escuela. Luego, aprendió matemáticas. Y por fin, regresó a casa a hacer la tarea. So first, he went to school. Then he learned math. And finally, he returned home to do his homework. Why are we using the preterite here? Well, there's two things you could say. You could say it's a series of events, because it is. You also could say it's transitions. There's a lot of transitions here. Primero, luego, por fin. Um, and then number five, ellos leían cuando el teléfono soñó. They were reading when the phone rang. Ooh, notice, they were reading. That's an ongoing action. When the phone rang. So the ringing of the phone interrupted the reading. Okay, so that, those are our reasons as to why we would use the preterite. Well, now let's talk about the imperfect. So you have voiced as your acronym for the preterite. For the imperfect, you have the acronym U-Toad. You ugly old toad. U-Toad. U-T-O-A-D. Okay, the U in U-Toad stands for used to. Remember, we commonly translate the imperfect. When I was a kid, I used to blah, blah, blah. Um, typically, you see the following trigger words associated with the imperfect. Siempre, always. Nunca, never. Todos los días, every day. Cada año, every year. Cada verano, every summer. And cuando yo era niño, when I was a little boy. Used to, you toad. The T of you toad stands for time. Uh, when you say what time it was when something happened, like, man, it was 1 o'clock in the morning when I went to Taco Bell. Okay, that it was one o'clock in the morning, that time is the imperfect. Era la una de la mañana cuando fui a Taco Bell. So, you toad, used to, time, 
The O is for those ongoing events. Uh, remember, this is the event that gets interrupted. So the dumb blonde was walking down the stairs when she got snatched. Walking was the action that got interrupted, so was walking is the imperfect. Age, when you say how old someone was when something happened, I was 15 years old when I got my learner's permit, okay? That would be imperfect, age. And then finally, the D. The D in UTOAD stands for description, describing what people or things used to be like. So he used to be really nice when we were kids, okay? So now I'm gonna hide my answers from you again. I want you to give me a reason from UTOAD as to why we're going to use the imperfect in each of these examples. Number one, eran las cuatro cuando tú llegaste. It was four o'clock when you got here. Well, it was four o'clock. That's a time. So the T of you toad, imperfect. Ellos tenían ocho años cuando el 11 de septiembre ocurrió. They were eight years old when 9-11 happened. Well, they were eight years old. Uh, that's a specific age, which triggers the imperfect. Number three, nosotros siempre tocábamos el piano. We always used to play the piano. There's two things you can say here. You can say, oh, 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 siempre is a trigger word. Boom. Imperfect. Okay, but if you want to use a reason from Toad, used to would be my best one. We always used to play the piano. Number four, tu gato era simpático y grande. Your cat was fat and really nice. Or big and really nice, sorry. Uh, so your cat was really nice and really big. Um, that's a description of the cat. And number five, ellos leían cuando el teléfono soñó. We talked about this one a little bit already. They were reading. That's the action that gets interrupted. It's the ongoing action that is interrupted by the ringing of the phone. So those are our reasons for you, Toad. Okay, so now as we start, uh, or continue this process, I want you to look at some examples in English. When I was 17, I visited Ecuador. When I was 17, predator imperfect. It's going to be the imperfect because I'm talking about age. I visited Ecuador, predator imperfect. It's going to be predator, ED. I want you to take a moment, pause your audio, and read uh, these next two sentences and decide whether or not the underlined words are going to be predator imperfect. Okay, take a moment and read these, pause your audio, and play again when you're ready. All right, now that you've had a second to try, while Grayson was buying shoes, Blaine was looking at hats. Well, Grayson was buying shoes, that's an ongoing action. Blaine was looking at hats. These are both imperfect. So, Notice uh, while, which in Spanish would be mientras, is that connecting word, oftentimes connecting two um, ongoing actions at the same time. So both of these are imperfect. While Grayson was looking at shoes, Blaine was looking at hats. Um, and our, our next one, Riley was walking the dog when the car hit him. Oh no. So Riley was walking the dog. That's my ongoing action. When the car hit him. I don't know if the car hit the dog or hit Riley. But uh, either way, the cars hitting the dog or Riley uh, would interrupt the action of walking. So Riley was walking, my ongoing action is going to be in the imperfect. But when the car hit him, that's my interrupting action, and therefore it's going to be preterite. So you've done this in English. Now let's give it a shot in Spanish. Uh, the model that I've given you here says, Yo comenzar a estudiar. I began to study. Well, remember, you can only begin or end things one time. And comenzar and terminar are beginning and ending verbs that always use the preterite. So comencé is my option. It should be preterite. And my reasoning was beginning or ending of an action. Let's do another one. Yo miraba, stranger, no, sorry. Yo miraba the stranger cuando llamó or llamaba mi padre. So I was watching the stranger when my dad called, okay? How many times did dad call? Once. Is it predator imperfect? I don't know, how do you know? Well, dad's calling interrupted my watching of Stranger Things. So when something is uh, the interrupting action, it does the interrupting, it's preterite. So we should say, yo miraba the stranger cuando llamó mi padre, and our reason would probably be something like interrupting action. Let's do one more, number two. Cuando yo era niño, when I was a little boy, 
yo siempre querer ser médico. So when I was a little boy, I always wanted to be a doctor. Well, when I was a little boy, I always used to want to be a doctor. I don't know if it happened or not, but um, we know I'm talking about childhood, cuando yo era niño. We know there's a trigger word of siempre, so we're going to have to use the imperfect here. It should be quería. Okay? Go ahead and pause your audio and give numbers three, four, and five a try for me, please. Okay, now that you've got a second to try these, number three says that Eric tuvo or tenía 18 años en 2019. So Eric was 18 in 2019. We're talking about Eric's age. Age is imperfect. We should say tenía. My reason would be age. Number four. Primero, él jugó los videojuegos y luego él hacer la tarea. So first he played video games and then he did his homework. Well, um, what do you think? Predator and perfect. Well, first he played his video games and then he did his homework. Well, it's a completed action. Played video games, did homework. So that's one reason it could be predator. The other one is that you have transition words here, primero y luego. And the other reason is that it's a series of events. He played video games, did his homework. Okay, uh, number five. Nosotros fuimos a Pals y comer en Blackbird. So we went to Pals and then we ate at Blackbird. So um, in this case, this is also a series of events. We went to Pals and we ate, comimos en Blackbird. So going to be preterite. Okay, also in this chapter, you see more vocabulary related to like outdoorsy activities. I guess this goes with the vacation component. Um, and there's things like camping. Over here to the right, you see hacer camping, to do camping. La tienda de campaña, the tent itself. Uh, you can see a photo of a lake here, el lago. Here, these people are in a canoa, a canoe, in the rio, the river. And uh, this woman has to remar, she has to row. Uh, down here, these people are getting ready to hacer una parillada. They're going to have a barbecue, hacer una parillada. Um, over here, this is more my area here, the playa, the beach. La playa is the beach. Uh, you can see they're right here on the costa, right on the coast near the water. Uh, the sea or the ocean would be el mar, el mar, the sea, or el océano, the ocean. Um, inside of the ocean, you see lots of things going on. You can see uh, these people over here are getting to hacer a snorkel. <laughs> they're going to snorkel, hacer a snorkel. Down here, this dude gets to bucear, to scuba dive. And uh, here this guy gets to correr las olas, literally to run the waves, or we would say to surf the waves. Um, also over here, you can see it's important to wear bloqueador solar, solar block, or we would say sunscreen. Uh, and this guy likes to tan, broncearse, to bronze himself, literally. Um, yeah, so you got some good words there. Um, in relation to these vocab words, you might be asked to do an activity like this, where I've asked you, A la familia Gomez le gusta estar cerca del agua, pero no pueden ir a la playa. So the Gomez family likes to be near the water, but they cannot go to the beach. Deciden visitar un blank en las blank. So they decided to visit a blank in the blank. They decided to visit a, maybe a lake, un lago. And then maybe this is the lake in the mountains, un lago en las montañas. Uh, it says, no necesitan hacer reservaciones en un hotel porque van a hacer blank. They don't need to make reservations in a hotel because they're going to go, hmm, well, if they're not staying in a hotel, they're probably going, yeah, good job, hacer camping, hacer camping. It says, no quieren comer en un restaurante. They don't want to eat in a restaurant. Because van a hacer una blank. They're not going to eat in a restaurant because they're camping and they're going to have a barbecue. Parillada. Parillada. Okay. I think you can handle those. Uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about tonight are affirmative and negative words. And these are sort of hard for speakers of English, right? Um, you probably grew up with an English teacher who, who yelled at you about double negatives. Um, you say, I know someone who speaks Spanish, or I don't know anyone who speaks Spanish. But uh, actually, the funny thing is in the Spanish language, you say the same thing. I know someone who speaks Spanish, 
But when you make it negative, you say, I don't know no one who speaks Spanish. You actually have to have double negatives or sometimes triple negatives in Spanish. And it makes your brain hurt. If you grew up speaking English, it's just hard to understand. So let's look at some examples. Um, okay, there wasn't anybody on the beach today. That's what we would say in English. But in Spanish, we would say there wasn't nobody on the beach. Um, in English, we would say Riley didn't know anything about calculus before taking the class. But in Spanish, we would say Riley didn't know nothing about calculus before taking the class. So it sort of hurts your brain a little bit to think about these. These are your common affirmative and negative words, and I've placed them this way in the chart because they sort of play off of each other. So for example, you have algo, which means something, and you have the opposite of that over here, nada, which means nothing. So repitan, algo, something, nada, nothing. We have alguien, someone, and nadie, no one. You have algún, some or any, and ningún, none, or not any. These can also take various forms depending on uh, the situation where they're used, and I'll be telling you more about those, but you have alguno, alguna, algunos, and algunas that can also mean some or any, depending on um, the noun that they're used with, you know, they have to agree. Um, so algunas tareas, alguna tarea, etc. Uh, and then you have the negative part of that, ninguno, ninguna, ningunos, ningunas, none or not any. So ninguna tarea, ningunas tareas. Um, sometimes and not ever, you have alguna vez or algunas veces, sometimes, and ninguna vez, not ever, not even, not one time. You have siempre and nunca, siempre, always, and nunca, never. You have también, also, and tampoco, neither, uh, or not either. And then o, o, either, or, and ni, ni. So I want either the chicken or the steak, and I want neither the lobster nor the shrimp. Okay, either or, neither nor. So these are probably confusing. You have to memorize these. That's the only way you can learn them. Just learn what they mean, make flashcards for these. As far as the usage of them in a sentence though, I have a trick to help you. Um, if you ever studied algebra and math, you learn that what happens on one side of the equal sign must also happen on the other side. So in these sentences, the first thing you want to do is find your verb. Okay, and your verb of your sentence is going to serve as your equal sign. If whatever to the left of your verb is positive, then whatever to the right of your verb, the rest of the sentence is going to be positive. If whatever to the left of your verb is negative, everything else to the right of your verb is going to be negative as well. An example here. It says, Maria conoce a alguien en la fiesta también. So Maria knows someone at the party also. Well, what's our verb here? Maria knows. Knows is my verb. So you can see I put an equal sign here. I'm saying she knows, not that she doesn't know. So she knows. That's positive. So that means everything else in the sentence is going to use the left side of this chart, these positive or affirmative words. So Maria knows someone, alguien, in la fiesta, también. She knows someone in the party also. Let's take that same sentence now and make it negative. So instead of saying Maria knows, I'm gonna say Maria doesn't know. So no conoce. So now with conoce serving as your verb, you do have a negative. You have a no to the left of that. So everything else in your sentence is gonna be negative. So literally, Maria doesn't know no one in the party neither. Yeah, I know it hurts my, hurts my English to say that also. So again, your your verb is serving as an equal sign, and you have to decide. Remember, what happens on one side of the equal sign always happens to happen on the other side. Um, some more examples for you here. Uh, you can omit the no in the expression um, when the negative expression comes in front of your verb. So, for example, fuimos a la playa con la familia Smith. We went to the beach with the Smith family. If you want to say we never went, you don't have to say Nunca no fuimos. You can just say nunca fuimos. We never went as an example there. Um, another example with alguien and nadie. Remember, find your verb in the sentence. Viste a alguien ayer nadando en el mar? Did you see someone swimming in the ocean yesterday? 
Well, did you see? That's positive. It's not saying you didn't see. You, there's no no in there. So did you see anyone? Viste a alguien? And the person answers and says, no, I didn't see anyone. So in this case, I didn't see, that is negative. So I didn't see, V, my verb, there's an equal sign, there's a no in front of it. So instead of saying I didn't see anyone, which is how we would translate this in English, I didn't see no one. I'm going to use nadie. Okay. Um, and now, referring back to those weird ones we talked about, algunos, algunas, ningunos, ningunas, you'll almost always use ninguno and ninguna in the singular form. Unless there's some kind of like inherently plural noun or something that comes in pairs. Like for example, te quedan algunas entradas. Do you have any tickets left? Um, and this person says, nope, no me queda ninguna entrada. So you see it both ways there. In the question, you have entradas, tickets. So you had to use algunas, any tickets. But in the response, again, there's a no in front of my verb. So no... I don't have any tickets left. No me queda ninguna entrada. Another example there, similarly, um, encontraste algunas lentes. Did you find any glasses? Nope, no encontré ningunos lentes. Uh, so did you find any glasses? Nope, I didn't find any glasses. So on and so forth. Um, okay, I have a couple of sample problems here related to these. Um, number one, no fuimos blank al Marco Marcos. So we didn't go blank to the beach with Marcos. We didn't go nothing. We didn't go never. We didn't go no. There's already a no here in front of my verb. You know, it's going to have to be negative. It makes the most sense to say we never went. So uh, nunca fuimos. Number two, no quiero blank jugo de naranja blank jugo de manzana. So I don't want orange juice or apple juice. In this case, you are you kind of want to say, oh, oh, I don't want orange juice or apple juice. However, because there's a no in front of quiero, remember you have to use the negative one. So it should be ni, ni. No quiero ni jugo de naranja, ni jugo de manzana. Number three, blank está caminando por la calle. So blank is walking through the street. Something or someone. It makes the most sense here to say someone, alguien. Okay, so just some answers for you there. Um, these are straight from your book. These are questions you're gonna have to do in, in um, I wanna say my Spanish talk. These are questions you're gonna have to do in MindTap this week. Um, it gives you in the model, yo siempre voy con mi familia de vacaciones. It gives you a sentence that's positive. And you just have to take it and turn it around and make it negative. So instead of saying I always go with my family on vacation, you say, I never go with my family on vacation. So you're changing out the word always, siempre, and making it never, nunca. Okay, here's another example for you. Um, number one says, sirven algunos platos típicos en el restaurante. So instead of saying they serve some typical dishes in the restaurant, we want to say they don't serve any traditional dishes. So instead of sirven algunos, we want to say they don't serve, no sirven. Remember, you need the no in front of sirven in order to trigger that um, negative word afterwards. So, no sirven ningunos platos típicos en el restaurante. Look at number two. It says, Marta quiere comer algo en, el, en la playa. So, Marta wants to eat something on the beach. We want to change this and say she doesn't want to eat anything, or literally she doesn't want to eat nothing on the beach. So instead of Marta quiere, she wants, we're going to say Marta no quiere, she doesn't want um, to eat anything. So instead of anything, Marta no quiere comer nada en la playa, nada. Okay, I want you to pause your audio and give number three a try for me where it says alguien in a balneario, sabe correr las olas. Take a moment, pause your audio, and give this one a try. All right, now that you've had a second to try, instead of saying someone in el balneario sabe correr las olas, we want to say no one there knows. So we just need to change alguien, someone, to nadie, no one. Pretty easy there, okay? So hopefully, you're feeling pretty good about the things you've learned in this chapter. And guys, as always, we've come full circle. 
Now you should know how to communicate about holidays, special events, and vacations. You should know how to inquire and provide information about people and events, how to communicate about past events and activities, how to create questions in Spanish using interrogative words, how to differentiate between the preterite and the imperfect, and how to use these affirmative and negative expressions in written and spoken speech. Guys, thank you for taking the time to listen to this video lecture. Hope everybody has a wonderful week. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email, mtharrison at pstcc.edu. Have a great day, everyone. Ciao.